Japanese channel one. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the very early morning session for the first day World Economic Forum here in Tianjin. My name is Tian Wei, the moderator for this specific session. The session is going to be about the global economic update for the year 2015. I remember there was an American politician who used to say about government and its policies toward the economy. He said, if the economy moves, just tax it. If it keeps moving, just regulate. And if it stops moving, just subsidize it. Of course, that's a very easy way of describing what the economy is and how the government should do about the economy is to simplify the version. In fact, economy in the world, including many of the regions and countries these gentlemen cover in the world, are much more complicated than just these three steps. That's why we're having a panel of wise men sitting with me here, a very strong panel, six of them, early in the morning, to talk about the realities of today's economy and what it is likely to be for the year 2015. My great honor to introduce one by one, not necessarily in this order, I'll go with the order provided by the organizer, Mr. Akira Amari, who is the Minister for Economic Revitalization and Minister for Economic and Fiscal Policy from Japan. Sir, welcome to, our pro to the event. <laughs> Professor Victor Haberstadt, Professor of Economics with the Leiden University in the Netherlands, and he's also with the Global Agenda Council on Geoeconomics. Professor, wave to the audience. <laughs> Professor Li Dao Kui, Dean from the uh, Tsinghua University. He is with the Schwarzman Scholars Program. Welcome, Professor. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have uh, Mr. Luis Alberto Moreno, President of the Inter-American Development Bank. Welcome. <laughs> Professor Kenneth Rogoff. He is from the Public Policy and Economics with Harvard University. Professor, welcome. Last but certainly not least, great friend of World Economic Forum and many of ours, uh, Mr. Drew Min, who is the Deputy Managing Director of International Monetary Fund, the IMF. Welcome, sir. Six of you. All right, we're going to have fun because we have such a strong panel and time is only one hour. How is that possible? So let me just begin by asking one brief question. Reality check. Let's just do it a, a little bit. Mr. Drew. In your mind, economy 2015, biggest concern, where are likely to be the trouble spots? Well, the first thing is, um, I'm not sure I'm the wise man. I'm getting old, but I, <laughs> many times I'm very stubborn. So I guess the others are, but not me. I mean, looking for 2015, I would say, if you're looking for this year, the global economy continues recovery, but in a very moderate path. We uh, downsize I just our forecast for this year roughly 3.7 3 to 3.4. But I can tell you the first half, the global economic growth was surprisingly weak, and, uh, which really uh, will say something about the futures. I mean, the whole thing is because the different economy in the different business cycles, advanced e economy is to try to get out of recessions. But now, for example, the US in the top, but many others, for example, Europe and Japan is not out yet. And the emerging market is over the cycle now. So we experience see the 90% emerging market 
had a slowed economic growth in the past 18 months as well. So this is two very different cycles I think were dominant for the growth for the next year. And plus, if you think about access for the non-conventional monetary policy, which obviously will bring the uncertainty to the market as well, I think people have to take that into the consideration. And uh, 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 geopolitical risk, another big concern, I think, at the mind for everybody is. So bring them together, I would say the key issue for next year, the challenge is still is the job and the growth. All right. Well, the message is clear. Let's go to some of the regions, since you talk about the general challenges. Professor, help us that. Let's go to Europe. So, what is European Central Bank like to do about deflation? Um, well, let me first say Europe is struggling. It's struggling more at this time uh, than uh, we had foreseen earlier in the year. And if we look at the outlook for the remainder of the year and for 2015, as for the global outlook, I, I fully subscribe to what my friend Ju Mint just said. But for Europe, I believe that perhaps a more sluggish than expected development is on the cards. And more sluggish really implies that Germany will continue doing better than the periphery, but that the, the rest of Europe will largely be uh, uh, considerably below trend in its economic activity, and thus the outlook uh, calls, and we may speak about this later, the outlook calls for action uh, uh, of the authorities of the ECB and of governments. Mm. For action, well, it means political commitment, isn't it? But it also means there's a lack of uh, specific setup that is suitable or catering to the political commitment. Yes, surely. Um, um, uh, Europe is a uh, European Union and the Eurozone are processes. Uh, they have only been constituted in the past few decades. And uh, it's obvious to everyone, um, has been obviously for many years in World Economic Forum meetings, uh, that constructing uh, the, uh, the European economy, the European Union economy, and constructing the monetary union is, a, is an enormous challenge. And creating the, uh, the political institutions, which really means uh, creating institutions which allow for transfer of sovereignty from sovereign nations to the Brussels level is a, uh, a big, big problem. Uh, which is not facilitated by low economic uh, performance, neither is it by political unrest in various countries. Professor Rogoff. Can I, can I sure, please. I mean, the, on Europe, I think Vic made this very clear. I think the good news is European economy move around the corner now. So it's out of recession, it's good. But the, the really the bad news is recovery is very weak. It's yes. very fragile, as you mentioned. Yes. So in the Europe, they both need the demand policy and the supply policy. Yes. In the sense, they continue to need a quantitative easy monetary policy to support aggregate demand. I think this is all the issue because demand is so weak. But meanwhile, I would say in the Europe, the structural reform and the supply side policy reform become ever more important now. I think these two things, not only one thing, not only the demand policy, two things will define the growth in 2015. I, I fully subscribe to that, and actually it has been the IMF view and the view of many economists around the world, not only in Europe, that uh, a multi-pronged approach is required. And it's only last week, actually, uh, that the, uh, uh, the central bank has indicated, though not unanimously, uh, has indicated that it, uh, it will start on a policy which uh, is not yet QE, something like QE. Uh, and which also will require the structural reforms in the largest uh, uh, weak economies. Just re recap for everyone in this room, France and Italy together are one-third of the European economy. Uh, and they are struggling and have been struggling for a fair number of years. And uh, we will need to see them improve their economic performance before there will be a more general uh, improved performance in Europe. They are just so reluctant to use the word QE, don't they? Um, Professor Rogoff, uh, the U.S. was not very shy about that to begin with, but right now we see the economy seems to be apparently getting better. But how much better? 
And what would that mean for the Federal Reserve when it comes to the bond buying programs? Well, certainly the way it looks is that the United States is in a fairly solid recovery. Uh, I'd say there are a couple other countries that are, you know, doing well. The UK, at least I would have said that till a week ago when Scotland threw a uh, monkey wrench in the works. And then, you know, Canada. There are other countries, I think, doing, doing okay. The United States really is in a different place, having uh, emerged more solidly. That said, I think we have to have a lot of humility about saying that because as we look at this uh, recovery, for example, look at Federal Reserve forecasts, they publish individual forecasts, and they're always coming down each time, each time. They have never guessed too low yet. And so there's this optimism. It's, it's the same for private forecasters, more or less the same for the IMF, uh, for everyone. It is very, very typical uh, after a financial crisis that you have years and years of slow growth, as uh, my, my work from uh, seven or eight years ago showed. On the other hand, if the U.S. continues uh, to recover, then there will be a moment when the Federal Reserve has to raise interest rates. And markets are not prepared for that. They read about it. They say it's possible. But again, looking at the forecasts of the governors of the Federal Reserve, they're up here and the markets are here. They just don't believe it. They don't believe they do it. And I think not only they don't believe they do it, they can't imagine how they would react. It's very hard to have a tightening cycle. It's not an easy thing. You do it to stop inflation. But there are very few examples where it's really uh, smooth. And just flipping over to, I'm here in China, make one final remark. Many of the countries of the world are trying to speed up. I think in China, you know, we're in a place where everything's trying to stabilize. Stabilize growth, stabilize pollution, stabilize power usage. And that is not easy to slow things down. The U.S. is facing it, and maybe China, too. Mm. Well, there is a debate about the so-called normalization, because that is so important it's being used as a standard when the government or Federal Reserve should act. What to you is the word normalization? I mean, What if, does that mean to you? Well, I, th I think we're still coming out of the financial crisis, and you can't even begin to talk about normal yet. And the rest of the world is certainly not there. I think the questions, how much risk to take that you wait too long and inflation gets out of control, that's really the debate. My personal view is that this is so catastrophic, what the world's been through, you want to err on the side of letting inflation drift upwards for too long. But if they do that, they'll get a lot of criticism. But if they tighten and the economy flattens, they're going to get a lot of criticism. Well, all right. Yeah, sure, yeah. please. I think this is such an important issue. You mentioned normalization. I mean, I would call it access to the non-conventional monetary policy. Mm. This is such a big issue. And uh, fair access to non-conventional monetary policy, not only a big issue for U.S., but for entire the whole world. We had very interesting studies. The study says if the Fed access to the, to the conventional, uh, uh, non-conventional monetary policy was in line with the growth, with the proper good financial foundations, so that with the good communication, that means uh, it's a positive shock, which will be good for U.S. growth and probably will have a positive impact for the global growth as well. But if the exit process rather in line with something else, for example, more on the financial instability in the financial market, not completely in line with the growth and with a few other issues, and uh, not well communicated, it could have a quite a big negative impact, not only for US and also for the whole world. I think this is a very big issue. So we need a global attention, a global cooperation on these key issues. On the exit side, there's a fair policy operation on site, but there's a market response issues. Exactly you mentioned, the market and the Fed has a big gap now. I'll just give you a few things. The price, the assets today, repricing, relocation is a big deal, right? For example, in today, in the bonds market, 
The pie of the bonds need to be clear, and the dealer's inventory is a huge gap. We had the lowest dealer inventory in the bonds market ever in history in, in, in the U.S. That means there's a structure in the market. So whole market response is also big issues. And the third issue is how country prepares themselves to respond to the U.S. Fed access to its uh, non-conventional uh, monetary policy as well. So this is a big issue, obviously, for next year, 2015. And Professor Rogoff, you got a chance to respond. This is not a rare thing that you are debating with the IMF representatives. <laughs> My good friend, Xu Min. Um, well, I think it's not just unconventional monetary policy in the QE. That's over. That's ending unless things go much worse. The question is when they actually start raising interest rates. And that, that moment is coming, at least on current policy. So markets were having a hard enough time wrapping their head around just having QE, which is not nearly as powerful as raising interest rates coming. And so that concern, you know, eventually, I think, is going to weigh in. And again, it, I, I agree completely. This is a huge thing in global markets, almost exaggerated the importance of it. Well, I mean, you hear, you know, there's instability, a geopolitical instability in Europe. Don't worry, the ECB will do QE and it will be okay. I mean, it's, the tool is only so powerful. But it's, it's uh, assets are priced and a lot of debt is taken on with the idea that the interest hikes, if they're coming, are long delayed and very slow. But the Federal Reserve governors, when they're giving their forecasts, are saying, no, that's not what we're intending. It's mm -hmm. going to be faster than that. So that could be quite a shock to the system. All right. Can I add one more? I'm, Briefly. I, I think this is a very important issue, but I, I really think I talked too much. So I will <laughs> completely shut up after that. <laughs> Care is absolutely, absolutely important issue. There's people usually forgotten. The rising in interest rates. It's not a circle of the liquidity. The interest rates have a few implications. Number one, when the interest increase, the assets have to be repriced, which will cause a global capital uh, flows, relocation, repositioning, repricing. I think that's the big issue. That's what we observed in May 23rd last year. Uh, in January, February this year as well. The second thing is more important. The interest is will not go, we observed in the last May 23rd, the interest will, will be very volatile. Mm. A volatile interest rate is a killer for the market because for the short-term asset holders, you don't know how to price your assets. So Mr. Zhu, what would but you propose? More than that, no, I think another point is also important. The interest rates will have a fundamental impact on the government debts, can it's your book. I just want to give you an example. In 2007, the old advanced countries has roughly 72% of GDP of government debts. You know how much they paid interest rates at that time? 2.9% of GDP. So what would today, you propose, Mr. Chu? No, the point is today, how much debts they have? 107. So debts increased 50% in advanced economy. How much interest rates they pay for the debts? 2.9% of GDP. Mm. So debts increase 50%, but the interest payments is the same. So if interest increase will have a profound impact on the government fiscal policy, we should not ignore that. Now I'm going to shut up. <laughs> no, you will have many other opportunities to talk as well. So are the other panelists. And now let's go to Japan. The measures, other than the dividend, to strengthen the basis, and that will lead to greater consumption power and investment, and that will further strengthen the productive activities. So what we are aiming at is to achieve the virtuous growth of the economic cycle, and uh, with uh, the uh, better cycle, uh, the wages improve, uh, and uh, the uh, consumption improves and the corporate performance would improve, and then that will lead uh, investment in re uh, research and development and capital investment, and will lead it to a greater profitability of the uh, corporate uh, 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 side. And it is we are seeing the success, and I believe it will succeed. 
a lot of theory studies, wonderful theories, mm -hmm. but how is the reality, for example, is the tax increase correct? For example, what about the other policies, uh, foreign policies, uh, nuclear policies? Will, how will that influence the popularity of the prime minister? And as a result, has it impact on his economic proposals and is possible for success? Tax increase? consumption tax hike. We are in the phase of increasing consumption tax rate. We've done this once. And according to the process, we will have the second round in of uh, tax, uh, consumption tax hike in uh, October next year. This will be a source of uh, social security, the medical care and the nursing care and the child care, such social security. Half of that is supported by uh, debt, in other words, the deficit bond. But it will, it will not be sustainable. If so, then it's not trustworthy. And it will undermine the uh, credibility of a uh, uh, national bond. Therefore, sustainability of social security and to heighten the credibility of um, fiscal consolidation, we are trying to increase the tax uh, consumption tax rate. But at the same time, we have to ensure the viability of the economy. And to that end, in a couple of years, we will reduce the corporate tax rate down to the German level uh, reduction uh, by 6%. And you talk about the nuclear uh, policy. And it may be considered one of the concerns um, of foreign investors that increasing of the energy price. Biggest reason behind is that uh, other nuclear power plant, other than uh, that uh, hit, was hit by the accident, all stopped. And because of that, it uh, causes the additional energy cost of 3.6 trillion yen. Of course, nuclear power plant safety comes first. They will not give in there. Our safety standards are the severest uh, in the world. And when that uh, safety standard is cleared, the uh, nuclear power plant should uh, be, uh, re should resume operation. That will reduce the energy price. And this is a resolute stance of the Abe cabinet to achieve that. And about the foreign policies, you might be talking about uh, some frayed relationship between China and Japan. And in order to improve that, uh, 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 issues all related, not necessarily related to only Japan and China. Mm. So, uh, Japan, China, Japan, South Korea, improvement of the relationship, well, for each country. If there is some political concern, a political instability, or economic relationship, we uh, uh, try to separate the relationship, economy and politics. But uh, there are some uh, subtle issues. We cannot move to other places. In other words, every country should be very serious and earnest about the relationship of um, uh, the each other. And that would give good uh, impact on the economic relationship, for sure. It's not necessarily addressing whether the geopolitics might mean for the uh, Japanese economy. Probably he will need some time. Later, we'll let him explain further. Let me go to, uh, first of all, Mr. Zhu, you want to comment about that? And, or shall I go to next? Oh, OK. okay. <laughs> Let's go to Professor Lee. Uh, please, I, I Professor Ruggle. I just have one quick question for the minister, which is, I mean, when I look at Japan, the fundamental shock is demographics. They are ahead of, Japan is ahead of everyone else as an aging society, shrinking labor force. It's really hard to see how Japan can recover in the long run without permitting much more immigration than it does. Uh, it started, I think, with construction workers, but also, uh, you know, healthcare workers. Uh, this seems like, you know, the number one structural problem in mm. Japan. Even though, Mr. Minister, you have not studied in the United States, there is a U.S. professor proposed a question to you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. 
about the immigration. It is a delicate issue. And the declining of the population over a long run is the biggest challenge for Japan. And for future, uh, this will be a biggest challenge for other countries as well. And uh, in 2050, the current population of 127 million uh, will stabilize around 100 million people. That is the long-term uh, uh, policy and plan. What we'll be doing over the short run is to heighten the efficiency of the economy and to entice uh, those who are outside the uh, labor market to come into the labor uh, market and also to improve the uh, skill level of the existing workers and the wor worker uh, productivity would increase, and also uh, to ensure uh, the um, women's potential will be realized to the fullest extent. This is the biggest theme for the Abe cabinet, and this time the largest number of uh, the women ministers come into the cabinet, and the young uh, woman is one of the leaders of the party in power on the three-time election. But any of them in the near future. Let's go to Professor Li, Li Daokui from China. Um, you want to first of all respond to what uh, the minister just said, uh, particularly regarding Japan's relations with the neighboring countries and whether that is at all going to have an impact on the neighborhood economies, including that of China? Well, well before, uh, before answering your question, let me follow the good example of my good friend, Zhu Ming, by stepping out of my border and by said by your question, talking about the U.S. economy. Now, it seems to me that we have been focusing too much on the uh, aggregate picture of the U.S. economy. To me, the U.S. economy, judging from the GDP growth and the financial market performance, is rec uh, recovering beautifully. The numbers are very good. Right, GDP growth around 3%, uh, maybe 2.8, you can debate 2.7, but around 3%. Financial markets are doing very well uh, in terms of asset price. Housing market is recovery, and uh, unemployment uh, by your whatever standard you use is uh, declining. However, the issue in the US is uh, structural, social issues. The labor participation rate is very, very low. I think one of the lowest uh, in history. So I think talking about the U.S. economy, we have to talk about, we have to analyze the uh, midterm election to, to come in about two, less than two months, right? So um, I guess, well, it's also a question for Professor Rugoff. If in the midterm election, the Democrats uh, are doing not too bad, so maybe the fiscal policy will be relatively turned into expansionary, because right now your physical deficit is coming down drastically for various reasons, right? So that, I think that is a big, big variable in the equation in addition to talking about the monetary policy. So this is my two cents view. So it's possible for the U.S. economy to focus more on the physical policy and, there, and, there, and expand a little bit down the road next year. Now, coming back to the U.S., uh, about the China, Japan Middle of the year or end of the year, of course, that's another debate. Go sure. ahead. China now. Uh, China, okay. Uh, China or Japan, I think for sure the political relationship between the two countries is hurting. It's hurting both economies, and more so on the Japanese side than the Chinese side. Because after all, the Chinese economy is growing. The Chinese economy is reducing its reliance on the foreign markets. But for Japan, the same thing cannot be said. So very, very unfortunate. The diplomatic relationship is not doing very well. And uh, well, depending on which side you are on, you can blame the, you know, each side. But to me, I think the, uh, uh, the Japanese side is on the uh, uh, aggression, aggressive side. It's now making a lot of moves uh, not willing to recognize the reality. The reality is that there are disputes on islands. Just recognize the reality itself is already a big progress. Mm. So that, I think, some, something to be, to be done 
on the Japanese side. All right. We don't want to turn this into a geopolitical debate. I understand. But I still need to be fair so that Mr. Minister could just briefly respond to what you said, and then we go to first questions about China with sure. you. Mr. Minister. About the islands, territorial disputes, oh, there are no disputes as such in our view in the past, now, and in the future. That's the Japanese position. And uh, you said that uh, Chinese economy, not much worry, but a gr uh, greater impact on the Japanese economy. We are dependent on the uh, overseas market. Thanks for your concern and worries. On our side, the, we are trying to strengthen Japanese competitiveness and the perception to that end, we should get out of deflation. Otherwise, we cannot really feel the impact of the growth um, policy under the deflation. The less you spend, the value uh, would uh, uh, increase of the money because the value of the goods would decline in deflation. And under that, if we try to stimulate uh, uh, investment or industry strengthening policy, it would not be effective. That's why we are trying to get out of deflation. In case you go into deflation, uh, it may be a reference to you. And uh, your uh, worry, uh, we uh, can understand. Uh, and uh, about the Chinese statistics, there might be some questions and skepticism uh, by the expert, such as a power consumption or cargo transportation and the uh, capital uh, supply over long to medium uh, term. Maybe the premier uh, Li Ko Chan's uh, indicators are trustworthy. And uh, based on that, there may be some question about the growth path uh, you are talking about. And what you would have to think would be a middle income uh, uh, trap uh, for or China. Uh, the wage increases uh, and uh, uh, competitiveness may, uh, might decline. What's needed would be structural reform. And structural reform of the national economy, uh, national companies or, or the public owned companies. Can you do that? That's the question. Reform and structural reform. That's the challenge we all face in the world, don't we? Have we done anything? What about China? Professor Li, obviously, Mr. Minister, is now shying off from uh, pointing out many challenges China is facing. So you want to respond to his question, particularly when you have uh, some of the issues going on right now, the anti-corruption campaign, and also uh, Earlier, we also had some people ask the Chinese Prime Minister already about the anti-monopoly campaign, how, whether foreign pound companies are being targeted. Uh, all of these when mixed up. How is it likely to impact on the Chinese economy, which at this moment, even though doing quite well, but still not keeping a high growth rate as it used to be? Professor Li. Uh, well, uh, it's very interesting to, um, uh, to be in a panel with the, uh, with the minister from Japan who is, um, seems to me very familiar with the Chinese economic issues, and perhaps more so than the Japanese economic issues. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I think in China, well, I think as, at least as an economist, I think I'm, I welcome uh, people from outside to be uh, interested in Chinese economy and Chinese economic issues. Uh, to me, the Chinese economy is in the middle of a very difficult and a challenging transition. The transition is twofold. On the one hand, uh, there's a need to shift the engine of growth. The new engines of growth have to take over the old engines of growth. Meanwhile, the, in the second, on the other hand, the structure of the institutions, uh, the institutions themselves, have to be uh, fundamentally reformed. On the first issue, um, we are talking about the old two engines, which are export and the property market development being facing away, uh, leaving room for new engines of growth. And the new engines of growth are gradually coming in, therefore explaining the current slowing down of the economy. And by implication, I do believe that the current slowing down is temporary. In other words, Chinese economy, in my view, is going through a U-shaped adjustment right now, coming down from over 10% of growth to something between 7 and 7.5%. And if possible, if the reforms are successful, the GDP growth rate should be able to recover 
a little bit because after all, the per capita GDP of China is only 19% of the US having tremendous potential for further growth. So what are the new engines of growth? They are fundamental consumption-based infrastructure investments, which are gradually coming in. However, financing for the infrastructure investment requires fundamental reforms, switching from short-term bank-based financing to long-term uh, bond, long-term bond, a low interest rate bond. That is a reform to be done in order to spur the new engine of growth. The second new engine of growth is uh, private consumption, which is gradually recovering. As a share of GDP, private consumption is increasing by 0.7% a year. So in the coming three, four, five years, it's possible for the share of consumption to be as high as 50% of GDP. Currently, it's about 43, 45%. That's the second engine of growth. Third new engine of growth is, I call, the greening up, the greening up of the production capacity, running from steel to petrochemical, the power generation, where tremendous investments are needed in order to upgrade the production capacity. Now, on the reform, on the reform side, uh, in my view, there are two steps of doing reforms. The China is now doing the first step of reform, that is top-down reforms, to clean up government behavior, to clean up corruption, to greatly reduce government uh, intervention in, the, in economic affairs, especially ex ante, ex -ante uh, interference, meaning approval, and perhaps beefing up exposed regulation, exposed uh, monitoring, of uh, business behavior. And also, uh, that top-down reform is also now uh, focusing on the legal system. In the coming one half month, I think we will see a big document lining out the upcoming reforms of the nationwide legal system, which has, will have in, tremendous implication for doing business in China. The second step of reform, which I believe uh, uh, will be coming in a few years, would be bottom-up reforms, including experiments with the reform of state-owned enterprises, as Minister just mentioned. So reforms in China usually take phases, and in this round of reform, there are no exceptions. Currently, the focus is on top-down reforms, and the bottom-up reform is, on, is gradually coming because many officials, frankly mm -hmm. speaking, are confused. They are facing a transition from the old business model of, uh, of uh, dealing with business to the new model, which should be more, regu more, more um, regulated and based on rules. So that's going on in China. Mm. Of course, we're all looking forward for the fourth session of the 18th Central Party Committee, which is going to be, as you said, uh, start in a few months. So Mr. Zhu, um, even though you are coming from the IMF, uh, you were and still are very familiar with the Chinese situation. What do you think about all of these uh, political campaigns, anti-corruption and also economic and uh, rule of law campaigns, for example, anti-monopoly uh, campaign going on in China? What does that mean for the general ambience for the economy to grow? I think it's become ever clear in today in, in the world, if you want to run a healthy economy, you need the transparency. You need the good governance structures. You need the good institutional capacities, which you all against corruption, this type of things. So I think this, this is the general thing for the whole world, for all the countries. So I think that China is taking its very serious anti-corruption movements to, to ensure the governance structures, ensure the transparencies. I think that will pave the road for the future healthy and good economic growth. Is there a timetable, as uh, Mr. Lee just indicated? Oh, then you have to ask Mr. Lee. You say that I come from <laughs> International Monetary Fund. <laughs> Mr. Lee, is that the timetable confirmed by you, or is a general consensus there? I think there is a timetable for individual items of reform. For example, in the area of financial sector reform, there is a timetable of three years three years for the interest rates on the lending side, on, sorry, on the borrowing side, to be fully liberalized. On the lending side, it's already market-based. Mm. And 
again, for example, in the, in the area of financial reform, for the capital account convertibility, I think three years is often mentioned as the duration for the account to be basically opened up. So, uh, however, for the overall reform program, I'm not aware of any very well articulated timetable because overall, I think implementing reforms are very difficult. You have to do it step by step. Mm. Filling the stones while crossing the river, as Mr. Deng Xiaoping indicated decades ago. Mm. So it's hard to have an exact time, but now, what about Latin America? Do we have a timetable? They used to say when the U.S. sneezes, Latin America catches a cold, and now they switch to some, switch to when China sneezes, Latin America catches a cold. Is that really the reality, or there's too much exaggeration in it, Mr. Romano? Well, I think that's probably a picture of the Latin America of 20 years ago. I think there's been plenty of immunization along the way. Uh, Professor Rogoff did a fantastic book in which he described the many financial crises that existed over the centuries. And if you just look at a period of 25 years, Latin America had over 30 financial crises. So I guess we learned the hard way. Uh, and, and as a result, you have macroeconomic stability today. So what, what happened in Latin America over the past 10 years was really uh, a period in which uh, our economy is almost tripled in size. We had a lot of tailwinds. Certainly, for instance, South America especially, uh, uh, you can basically track uh, South America's business cycle increasingly with that of Asia and specifically on China, uh, largely because of the demand of uh, commodities, whereas the Caribbean and Central America and Mexico are largely uh, uh, much more impacted by what happens in the U.S. economy. So it's no surprise that today you see better growth uh, happening in Central America, Mexico, and, and the Caribbean than you, did, than you see in South America with, with some exceptions. Now, the big difference today, of course, is we have no aging problems. We have a demographic bonus. Latin American average age is 27. We have no geopolitical problems. We have plenty of energy. We have plenty of natural resources. We have a growing consumer market. Certainly, this change in, in, in tailwinds what in essence is implying the need for structural reforms, many of which have been spoken about here. Now, structural reforms certainly take time before the effects of those reforms have a repercussion on growth. And in a large extent, the need for Latin America is going to be largely to focus on increases in productivity. If you look back over the last 20 years, the, the, the cycle of productivity has almost been flat by comparison, say, to Asia, which has been growing uh, consistently over time. So if you were to simply introduce the growth of productivity of the United States uh, to be equal to that of Latin America, we would be probably growing uh, double the rate. This means that we would need to do far more in human capital investment, in the quality of education that we have throughout our system. We are very low in all of the international scores that are done especially those of the OECD. We have to do far more in innovation. This is increasingly a global economy where innovation matters significantly with a lot of uh, destruction in the process. These ne countries need to adapt to that reality, the way our uh, labor markets and how efficient they are. And more importantly, the huge lag that we have in investment in infrastructure, mm. which by comparison, say, to China, uh, we probably have been investing not even a third of what China has been doing for the last decades. So in sum, this means, on the one hand, huge opportunities for investment. And in this regard, we need a strong Chinese economy. We need a strong U.S. economy, strong Japanese economy, a world economy that can help us. Uh, but it is very different today than before because I think a lot of the growth can also come from our own domestic markets. And if we continue to have uh, some uh, macroeconomic stability is going to be critical. I'd like to close by picking on something that both uh, uh, Shumina and, 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 uh, and Ken mentioned, uh, which is the issue of when the Federal Reserve begins to consolidate its balance sheet, the impact on, on, on interest rates. When you look back at the, at the big crises that took place in Latin America, all of them happened 
largely because there was this kind of dry up of liquidity as a result of the increase in interest rates when you have these dislocations that Ken was mentioning. This is a very serious issue, and certainly we have reconverted a lot of our debt into local currency uh, in many of our countries, but still what happens to interest rates and the speed with which they go up will certainly have a huge impact on growth as we look forward to 2015 and, and beyond. What do you have in mind then? No, I, look, I mean, uh, uh, hearing uh, Professor Rogoff, I know what the Fed has in mind. I mean, there's little that we can do to affect that. I think the, the contrary point to that is how countries prepare themselves to basically signal the markets to begin to do their own uh, with their own central banks to anticipate uh, the shocks that could happen. Is Latin America prepared? Ready for that? Well, I, I think all in all, yes. I mean, there's certainly exceptions, but the, the larger countries, some will, are a little bit behind the curve, others are ahead. And the reality today, when you see countries like Mexico doing the kinds of structural reforms that it has done recently, it will benefit from growth that you will see largely because of the U.S., but a lot from the reforms that they have been mm -hmm. doing. And the other countries that are growing faster is because they have stayed at a pace where they have been doing some of these structural reforms. Mr. Drew? I want to say a few words. I know you travel to Latin America pretty frequently. I uh, very much agree with uh, my friends and Luis said. I think uh, uh, the federal policy will have uh, quite a big impact on the region as well. As uh, Luis mentioned, I think that's very important. And the key issue is for not only for Latin American countries, but for all the emerging markets, prepare themselves for the coming policy change. Mm. That means make sure your current account balance is okay, make sure inflation rates is okay, make sure your uh, uh, exchange rates is proper in line with the market rates, and make sure your fiscal deficit is not overblown. So there's a few things you have to do that. And in the region, we observe in the past 18 months, working very hard on the structural reform issues, on the macro adjustments issues. The the process is not even, that's for sure. Some were moving fast, some were not moving fast, but regions are well working on those issues, particularly after May 23rd losses shock. Yeah, I think that's our assessment. We are really running out of time, um, and we are all years, actually, we really want to learn more from you guys on the stage, but uh, let me just put out some very general questions and then invite some questions from our audience, and then we can interact with all of you. We covered a lot of regions and countries uh, by our panelists, their analysis, but there are many other questions really needs to be asked. For example, whether the, the QE policy is really going to uh, help us to save the world, or rather it is only a postpone of uh, the real issues that we should handle uh, with our own economies. That's one thing, for example whether geopolitics is likely to have a deep impact uh, given it's China, Japan, China, uh, Japan, South Korea, or Russia, the West, you know, whether these will have an impact on our economies in the near future. Meanwhile, what about some of domestic uh, politics going on in di different kinds of countries and regions? How is that? And meanwhile, the question of innovation, is it really going to bring a lot of new momentum to the real economies? These are all questions needs to be asked. We're, do not have the time for me to ask, but I'm sure our audience have a better way of asking these questions. So with the sign over there, we only have five minutes to go. Let me quickly go to the questions uh, from the audience. Raise up your hand, say where you're from, and just ask a question. Don't make a five-minute statement. Thank you very much. Uh, this gentleman over here, I'll try to address different areas. If you can, very briefly, sir. Thank you. Robert Milliner, B20 Sherpa from Australia. A uh, number of the panellists have commented on structural reform and on Mexico, which is probably the widest structural reform going on in the world at the moment. Uh, could you give us some comments about how we can work with governments to encourage greater structural reform? Many governments are actually backing off structural reform and being more protectionist. Thank you. Thank you. Which one you want to address to, or shall I just ask generally? Okay, Mr. Milliner. Well, the Look, it's easier to talk about structural reform than to do it because it requires building political consensus. The way Mexico did it, and President Peña Nieto was by, by creating a multi-party agreement that they called the Pact for Mexico. And they basically said a, a, a set of, of uh, reforms that needed to take place, and they were able very efficiently to pass many of these reforms. 
And I think at the end, it requires a lot of hard work, a lot of good political work, and a lot of leadership. And there is no a, a solution different than strong leadership for getting structural reforms through. Anyone else? I would just say, if I had to point to something that's disappointed me the most in the period since the financial crisis, it is the lack of structural reforms in the advanced countries. In the United States, nothing, basically. I, you could talk about the financial regulation, uh, Europe, Spain, Ireland, but there are many countries that have done, France and Italy, basically nothing. And it's very hard to come out of these things quickly. Everyone said, it's OK, we're going to be like Sweden. That's what everyone pointed out, because they come back really fast. But they shrunk their government. They did a lot of structural reform. And you know, we're many years past the Swedish experience now. Structural reform? The key question, I think, the po for the policymakers is to ask, what structure to reform? I think people talk is in the so general sense. The labor market reform is one thing. Infrastructure investments is one thing. Pension reforms is one thing. So they're all different. You need a different scheme. You need a different political base. But the key issue, you have to understand mm. what is the structure has been shifted. Can China be versatile yes, in very, figuring very, out all the structural reforms? Yeah, very quickly. How to encourage reforms? I think nowadays a big, big factor affecting reform is the media and public opinion amplified by the media. So um, I would think a balanced, patient, a long-term view would be very supportive of reform. On the other hand, a short-termist and very negative and focusing on the short-term unintended negative consequences of any reform in the media would disencourage reform. All right. I am having the sign from the organizer. We only have one question left. Is that what you're saying? One question. Uh, so let me just be like gender balanced. Uh, we got a gentleman earlier asking from outside China, asking a question. Let's have a, maybe a lady from inside China also coming from the media. I think this lady over here. One sentence, if you can. Go ahead. I'm Thank so you, sorry Tenway. for the others. Uh, several sentences for uh, Minister Amaral. I have a question on the uh, price level in Japan. As brief as possible, yeah, please. Yeah, I try to do that because question a little bit complicated. Um, uh, after 18 years of the Abenomics, the wage level in Japan finally started to rise. It's good news. But the bad news is that because the, the whole level of the prices started to rise at the same time because of the, uh, the depreciation of the yen, which pushes the, the real uh, which level actually down to the negative uh, level. In, in July, it, in, uh, it became to be the uh, uh, negative 1.4%, uh, which is very bad so news. So the question is? The question is, uh, according to the Goldman Sachs, it means the uh, failure of the uh, one uh, core target of the Arbonomics. Uh, do you agree with that? And how would you comment on that? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Minister, you probably only got 30 seconds. <laughs> I'm so sorry about this. Uh, uh, so my conclusion, I do not agree with what you said about wages and the, uh, the most immediate uh, monthly wage increase by 2.6%. It is after 17.5 years. Well, the prices naturally would uh, rise. We are trying to do it. And the prices kept on uh, dropping, and we try to uh, have it increase. And then consumption tax increase, so to that extent, um, prices would increase. What we are trying to do is achieve the um, wa wages would uh, um, go over the uh, 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 prices um, through multi years. So uh, it's a virtuous cycle. The enterprise profitability would increase and start a virtuous cycle. That's what we are doing. Mr. Minister, you did it beautifully. 30 seconds. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, we are running out of time for this uh, very wonderful session about the global economic prospect for the year 2015. I guess many of you have provided your knowledge, expertise, and your advice. And I guess one of the things we really should do is to act responsibly. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Warm applause to all of you. Thank you also, our audience.